Hello, I'm Lux, and Pacing! And I'm Ember, and what he said. And this is our thoughts on Shira, Princesses of Power, Season 1, Episodes 5 through 7. Pacing is the key word here. We're probably going to harp on this throughout the episode, but oh my god, the pacing on this show sucks. It's terrible. Every episode feels like it needs to be a two-parter. And that we're rushing through it. We're seven episodes in, and we had three episodes of Rebuilding the Princess Alliance. Three episodes in a row. One from the last recording with Flower Power, and then in this one with the mermaid and the girl with the creepy hair. It just It's all about the pacing, because as I said before, Steven Universe is an excellent example, especially the last couple of seasons, of excellent pacing. The episodes never feel too short or too long. You're always sitting there going, oh, that was only 12 minutes? Wow. Because there was so much information in there, and it didn't feel like they were like cramming everything they could into the episode. This feels like that. Every episode feels like we have to get all this information in there. They also, it also feels like they're trying to get to something they want to show us. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this stuff is important. Yeah, yeah. But, but you're going to want to see this. And that's what it feels like. It's like, I know you want to know more about this. Stuff. I'll tell you about it later. But this part's awesome. <laughs> so we want to hurry up and get to this part because it's awesome. I'm hoping the payoff is worth it because the pacing on this is horrendous. They have a nice art style. They have a good concept. We have a wide cast of characters, but we don't get time to know any of them. Also, Seahawk. And yay for sparkly eyes not being reserved for girls. They are everywhere. And I can see what they were trying to do with Seahawk, especially at the beginning when they meet him in the cantina, as it were, because they were trying to sum up as a more flamboyant slash more energetic version of Han Solo. They failed miserably. I liked his character near the end once he calmed down a little bit. That's another problem like I've seen so far. There's a couple of characters that have way too much energy. And we're talking about beyond Pinkie Pie levels of energy here. And not in the fun way. Just ridiculously hyper over the top. Yeah, it's just like, ease into that. Pinkie Pie even eased into it because her first interaction was like, oh! and then she disappeared. And everyone was like, okay. But this is like, these characters are like stuck at 10. They never come down from 10 unless there's like a spot where they want them to come down from 10. And then they're back up at 10. They, there's no breathing room. And speaking of Seahawk, what do you think of his new design? Well, it's a very nice update because the original Seahawk is very... 80s. Yeah. It's specifically 80s pirate because, you know, the beard and the scars and the ship and the, oh, I just work for whoever pays me. Oh, the horde's evil and I'm hurting people. Well, okay, since pretty Shira's asking me. <laughs> yeah, we had like none of that in this. Just him going, I set my ships on fire. Cool. I did like that one line at the very end. We're going to do what you do best. Set your ship on fire. <laughs> that was probably that and the mermaid princess and Bo and Bo with Seahawk when Seahawk, air quote, rescues him. Were probably the best moments in this episode. I would also include the whole fight between Katra and Shira. That whole scene. Because that wasn't really a fight. It was very one-sided. Catra really wants Shira, really wants Adora back, but doesn't really want to hurt her, though she did break skin this time. And Adora, in her Shira form, was mostly ignoring Catra as determining that the more important thing was to fix the connection on the gate. And does the sword have self-healing powers because Shira had scratch wounds, and those were gone later. Also speaking of Catra, some of the best Catra moments were Catra being cat-like. If you have ever had to hold on to a cat who is not interested in being held, you have seen Catra's reaction to Scorpina. 
Uh, I'm lucky enough that I've known very few cats that don't like to be held. I had cats that would lay on my shoulders as I walked around, okay? Well, even when they do like to be held, there are moments where they're not interested and you have to hold them anyways, like... Okay, it's kitten nearby. Vet's office. <laughs> but I'm liking the episodes. It's just the pacing is... Ugh, it makes it really hard to like these episodes. We don't get any time to connect with the characters. We were supposed to feel a lot of connection with Princess and Trapta's kitchen servants. There was no time to build up that connection. And there wasn't even any time for tension. Because they were supposed to do... It's, it looked like they were doing a horror opening. And they were supposed to have, like, have a horror theme to this episode because of how the robots were doing the things. But they failed at that. Mainly because they never held long enough on anything. No, they had to keep moving. And especially with horror and jump scares and anything scary you have to have your timing perfect yeah you have to hold it you have to hold it long enough for the audience to feel uncomfortable and then boom or you hold it and then give them what they're not expecting hi i'm not an expert at horror but i've watched enough horror that i know what i like and i've technically directed a horror movie but that's a different story <laughs> Oh, uh, one that's probably left, better left untold. Yes, I did. It was a great learning experience. Okay, moving on to the next episode of, I should say moving back to this episode of horror. I mean, just, they didn't handle it right. I know what they were going for. I gotta say the best part of that episode to me was drunk Shira? Drunk Adora. Yeah. Because she was detransformed. Also, that brings that this thing they introduced about the whole virus thing. I'm like, okay, that's an interesting concept because it can affect Shira. So, whoa. So, really hammering home that Shira and the sword is tech, but that there can be a crossover. So, a tech virus infected a human host because it messed up Adora. Even after she was detransformed. I think it's because of the way Shira works. At least in this iteration. Also, they're they're doing a great job in this series of making you go, Shira's not invincible. In the uh, original series, there's a lot of tension, but pretty much He-Man and Shira were like, invincible. We don't really have to worry. We know they're going to win because... Come on. I mean, we went over the list of her powers in the opener episode. She could pretty much do everything. But I mean, it was so, this was so tropish. Even, you know, cutting back to Entrapta at the end of, oh yeah, we don't have to worry about that disc anymore. It's destroyed and cut back to Entrapta rebuilding it. Though I'm not quite sure how they're going to handle that in the future. But they left it there for us to think about. Just... I really want more from the episodes, or at least give us a better sense of pacing, because they ruined a lot of the tension in this episode, because it was, move on to the next thing, move on to the next thing, move on to the next thing. It's like watching a modern comedy. There's no time to rest between the jokes. Yeah. Like, the, you, you can't get laughs every minute if you don't give people time to breathe. You can't get scary without giving people time to feel uneasy. So, though I do like the design of this next princess, though, like, the hair thing's kind of interesting. I wonder if her hair is technology, because that would explain a lot. Well, it's interesting that, you know, her princess ability seems to be her hair, but what she's good at is making tech. Mm-hmm. And apparently the robots were a new addition because the servants were like, is there going to be more of these? Yeah, because they, they like the one that took the snack because they're like, oh, finally, we don't have to navigate all these dang corridors. And I did like the servants, but the whole arc with them, once again, was rushed. I know what they were going for, the whole classic, us normals can fight too, but we didn't have any time to connect with them, to, go, to root for them to be these heroes. No, they were just barely there, and then, 
okay, we've got them motivated to fight, and they're fighting, and they're winning. Yeah, I do like the fact of like them using their um, skills and uh, not appliances, but there were dishes flying and <laughs> yes, and the fizzy beverages. And the design of the was it a castle? Castle fortress. I, I like the design of the fortress slash castle. They were going for that whole kind of gothic horror thing there, and they did a good job with the design. I guess it was just. Oi. <laughs> so anything else from this episode you'd want to go over? Well, I'm curious how first one tech, because everything we've seen about the first ones is like they're really awesome and really super advanced. So how did this disc have a virus in the first place? Was this a defense mechanism? Did Entrapta trigger it by scanning the disc for data? Because she got a lot of data out of the disc. And then, ooh, virus. Maybe it's a Trojan horse virus? You know, just, oh, this looks like something completely benign. Oh, wait, there goes my computer. But yeah, it definitely brings up some questions about the first one. Like, is this actually technology from the first ones? Or was this rival technology? Did the first ones have that disc because they were safeguarding it? Hmm. Interesting thought. But like I said, we, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, but we never get time to enjoy it. Nope. And now we move on to one of the most important questions. Okay, so what the heck is the difference between a princess and a sorcerer? Also, another thing that pops into my head is if that disc gets rebuilt, does everything that was previously infected become infected again? Probably only if it's in radius. But back to the question you just asked. I really don't know because they seem to be very similar, except for the last princess we ran into, her hair didn't seem to have a recharging station, so that goes that kind of connection out the window. Do you currently have any theories? Well, sorcerers can be male or female because we saw both male and female in Mysticor hmm. among the people who were practicing and the people who showed up for the ceremony, but we need some definitions, so... What's the difference between a princess and a sorcerer? Because they both have what the average audience member would go is, oh, they have magic. Another thing, since we're moving on this last episode of, why did they feel they had to hammer that, which would have been a kind of neat thing to think about, through so hard? Yes, light spinner, shadow weaver, do you want to shove it down our throats a little more? I mean, all you really needed to do in this episode was have Adora walk past a statue that had like maybe its knee was scratched out or the head was missing. It didn't have to be in shadows or anything because, oh my god. <laughs> but just something that she would have walked by and looked at and everyone would have been going, hmm... You didn't even have to talk about it. You could just have her notice it and ask, and they could have turned her down. Yeah, and we didn't have to have Shadow Weaver confirm it at the end. That could have, like, been at the end of the season or been a continuous thing throughout the season. You didn't have to, like, you didn't have to introduce this concept at the beginning of the episode and wrap it up at the end of the episode. So, yeah, again with the pacing. Basically, you didn't need to have all of that in the same episode. It would have been better to spread it out through multiple episodes. Start out with a little bit of a hint of like, hmm, I think this. But no, it was like, yeah, it's Shadow Weaver. But you just, it's Shadow Weaver. Isn't that interesting? Don't you want to think? I, I would have if you didn't tell me. I don't need to think about it because you told me. What, what else is there to think about? I mean, it's a good concept and everything, but you kind of just... You want to know who this is? I think it's... I was like, I think it's... It's Shadow Weaver! I was going to guess that. <laughs> also, what did you think of how they introduced Casta Spella? <laughs> As that ant. <laughs> yeah, and like, I, I, I can't really remember Casta Spella that much in the original, so... Uh, if I recall correctly, more of a redhead with a very gold design with some blue highlights. Personality. 
personality. We're talking about Jin Wen Shira. Stereotype. She was the mysterious sorceress. Okay, there. See? Personality. <laughs> it's the 80s. Personality is a stereotype. There were some enjoyable parts in this episode, though I'm getting a l I'm actually getting slightly annoyed about the stuff that they're doing with Glimmer. She's doing a lot of the come on with her family. She's stuck with all the tropes of the annoying family, and that's starting to kind of rub me the wrong way. I don't know why, but it's like <laughs> But that brings up going back to the first of these three episodes. Something where they actually did a nice info drop of Glimmer going, yeah, my mom won't take me seriously. You know, when you're the daughter of an immortal goddess and all you have is sparkle. <laughs> that was a good info drop because it was just off to the side. The yeah, queen is an immortal goddess. Yeah, it's, see, that's good. You just, bleh. <laughs> I think another thing that they may be suffering from is they may have written this show with binging in mind and didn't quite handle that correctly. Because when you watch Netflix, you tend to binge. I mean, Netflix even balances the release schedule a little bit in going, oh, this is about how many episodes people binge at once. So this is how long we'll make our seasons. To the annoyance of some creators. Yes. Cough, Voltron, cough. Also, apparently they've done that with Ladybug as well, because they just released the second part of season two. <laughs> I love how they still call them seasons, though. I'm like, no, that was the rest of the season you... But other than that, Netflix is doing a great job of getting a lot of shows and giving some shows a chance when other networks wouldn't have. Yeah, we're not going to go into the whole Marvel thing, so too bad. We're talking about She-Ra. I like concepts. I like what they're doing with most of the show, but oh my god. I'm not going to say it because I've harped on it enough in this episode, but just... Ugh. Well, I have something else. Okay, the, the trip to Mysticor is planned. Where's their camping gear? Why don't they at the very least have sleeping bags? Mm. Why, when they're camping out on their way to Mysticor... Are they using piles of moss and pulling their capes over themselves? You're right. They didn't have any... Huh. Yeah, no gear. Well, I'll be darned. I mean, it made sense in the pilot because Bo and Glimmer were just doing a quick recognizance run. Makes mm -hmm. sense there. Yeah. When I saw that, I almost felt like we were at the big back at the beginning and they were going to fill in stuff that happened on their trip back. Yeah, because they had no gear. Because when you're planning a trip, you take stuff. Mm-hmm. And that reminds me of another thing they could have done with this episode that they kind of failed on. They were trying to do that whole mind messing thing with Shira, with Adora. But once again, rush, 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 rush. And that didn't it didn't quite feel right. And we could have, like, left it... <laughs> better because it just wait because it was all really rushed and now it's done and over with because shadow weaver failed is temporarily out of commission and now catra is going to take over the plan of attack so we're not going to have any more of those shadow things following adora and at the edge of her vision and freaking her out and we're not going to have shadow weaver doing projections that look like her friends and say hurtful things and tear her apart. And that reminds me of another thing that happened while we were watching this episode. Near the beginning, you were like, I was wondering when Adora was going to lead one of those things to a secret location. That's not your exact words, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, basically, that's what I've been waiting for is because I'm like, I have to lead it somewhere. I mean, the big one would be lead one of those things back to Bright Moon. Because we know the Horde hasn't been able to find Bright Moon, and they really want to. I think it's almost less that they couldn't find it, and more that they can't get through that Seekin Forest, because apparently they're having to cut it down slowly over time. That also makes me wonder, like, like, so is the forest, like, regrowing and moving into the areas they've already cut? And they're like, gosh darn it. Quite likely. Ah, I just finished cutting down this tree. Smack! 
Gosh darn it. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to go over in these episodes or the episode we're currently talking about? Well, you know, we, and it's interesting to use the word finally in a series that is running through its material this quickly, we finally got the sword turning into something else because we turned the sword into a shield and Shira single-handedly completed the ritual that kept mag uh, Mr. Core's magical barrier in place. Did the sword ever transform into a shield in the original series? It transformed into everything. <laughs> Uh, so it was kind of like in the last season of Thundercats, how Lionel's sword could do everything. Yes. She's turned it into a lasso. She turned it into a space helmet. Space helmet could come into play in this new version. But the interesting thing was they were out in space. She needed a helmet, but Swiftwind didn't. It was an 80s kid show moving on. <laughs> yeah. An 80s kid show that was willing to tackle the topic of, I like you. And don't be afraid to say that. Because an episode with Seahawk, the overarching point was that Adora was afraid that Seahawk liked She-Ra better than Adora. And hmm. at the end of the episode, she finally, you know, kind of confronts him about it. And he's like, well... Yeah, sure, she was fun to battle and hang out with and stuff, but you're the one I want to spend time with. And so Luki's moral at the end of the story was don't be afraid to tell someone you like them because the answer just might be that they like you too. <laughs> I love the way you ended that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just these episodes, I... They had all three of them had nice concepts in them, but their executions just flat. It's like they're trying to do She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, the speed run. Yeah, without all the cool tricks. Because it's fun watching people do speed runs in video games. Because, oh my god, it's like, they just broke the wall. Or, I didn't know you could shoot a portal through a wall to get to the port. Wow, these people who do portal speed runs are crazy. Let's not forget the people who couldn't beat the original Mario in under five minutes. Oh, yeah. I think there's even a sub four now, so. <laughs> Crazy. But that's the real thing with these last three episodes for us is, well, the episodes we've seen so far overall is none of them have had really good pacing. I'm hoping the episode that we've got mentioned in our comments since apparently it's one to look forward to. I'm hoping the thing with that one is just, it's, it's got good pacing. Because right now, that's really what I want. Because the whole thing with Seahawk and the Mermaid Princess, way too fast. And we basically got everything through exposition. Remember, show, don't tell. And then with Entrapta, there wasn't enough time to build up the tension or to make the connections. And also the obvious thing at the beginning of, when are we ever going to use a sonic arrow? Well, now that you said that, this episode! Yeah, that should have been introduced in a previous episode. Like an off-to-the-side comment, like, I have all these cool things like this, and I have a sonic arrow, and, you know, just mentioning, like, a list of different type of arrows he has in a previous episode, and then it comes up here. Instead of putting it all in one. And then everything with Adora's sleep deprivation and the shadow creatures and seeing things and her friends just insisting that she's tired. And their apology at the end of we're so sorry we didn't believe you. Even that feels rushed because we didn't see this building up. We had Adora being perfectly fine transforming into back into She-Ra at the end of the Entrapped episode. Because... Okay, yeah, she was freaked out about it. Didn't know she could get sick like that. But by the end of the episode, Glimmer's encouraging her. Hey, that rock's looking at us funny. For the honor of Grayskull! Smashing a rock off screen. So obviously, she wasn't concerned right there. And then the next episode, look, Adora, we know you're worried about, you know, that whole thing with she -Ra. It really freaked you out. Really? When did that happen? It's almost like they're suffering from the multiple writers problem that... MLP had during certain um, seasons, like the quality episodes would go up and down, up and down because they had different writers for each episode. And I wonder if that's how they did this here, even though they 
had the like luxury of being with Netflix and the budget and the timing to produce the episodes quick enough, they may have had to have multiple writers. And because Adora was kind of wildly all over the place, like in that particular episode with Entrapped at the beginning of the episode, I was like, I don't remember Adora acting like that in the previous episodes. Like, why is she so now gung ho with being Shira and everything? Because first it was, I don't feel like myself. I feel like I'm losing control. I don't want to do this. Then it's, hmm, everyone likes me better as Shira. I'm going to spend this entire diplomatic mission as Shira. And now it's like, I will turn into Shira at a moment's notice. Oh, giant sea monster, I got it. Oh, rock, I got it. The giant sea monster one, I'm always, I was perfectly okay with, because that was another good scene in that episode. I got, whoa! <laughs> and, yep, I got it. I'm good. <laughs> yes, and Seahawk, you're a surprisingly capable crew. What did you need me for? Your map. Um, also, your ship. If the three of them could have just rode Swiftwind, trust me, they would have. Or had Madame Raz conjure those flying goats from one of the books that we read in Ember's reading room. Oh, yeah. Also, I think I just figured out why the pacing in Steven Universe works so well. Because they allow their audience to remember stuff from previous episodes. They set up stuff in previous episodes and then they introduce it later so they don't have to reintroduce it in the same episode and spend the time introducing this concept and then having to execute the concept in the same episode it's introduced in. They trust that we're going to remember it and we're not getting retold things except for when we have the off-color Sapphire because she says things right after they've happened. But that's the whole gag with her, and we love her for it, you cute little thing. Oh, Steven's going to be here, and he has a surprise! <laughs> After the surprise is already revealed. Yeah, that just hit me. That's why this pacing in Steven in Universe feels so good. Because they've set up things in previous, they've set up concepts in previous episodes, so they don't have to tell us about that concept in the episode they actually executed in. No, it's just there, and they trust that we're going to remember it, and if we forgot, that we're going to go look at the wiki. And here's the thing, you could actually use that in the fact that people binge your show. So you can trust that people will remember that thing you just set up in episode one, because they probably watched episode run like four episodes ago. So it's only like a half an, only like an hour between introduction of concept and execution of concept. That's shorter than most movies. I think people could remember. But we're introducing a concept, executing, and wrapping it up all in the same episode. And I think that's why the pacing feels so off to us. Because of that, they're taking time to introduce a concept, execute the concept, and finish the concept all in the same episode. To the point where these could probably be, re with the exception of the first two episodes, these could probably be rearranged in any order up to a certain point. Because they're all so self-contained. There's not a lot of continuity. <sighs> Though I think we've harped on this long enough. What do you think? Oh, yeah. So any final thoughts? Or do you just want to go straight into the outro? <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm interested to see how Catra is going to destroy Bo. Because she's specifically going for the heart. I remember that. One, she says heart. Two, Bo was in the sky, and three, Bo has a heart on his outfit, just in case we couldn't get it from the other two things. Because the one thing that we can agree on is that he is the glue that holds this trio together. So taking him out is going to do a lot of damage, way more damage than taking out the daughter of the queen, which is amazing, because you would think that would be more damaging, but it's not going to be. Nope. Even though with all this harping we've done on pacing, I'm still looking forward to the next episodes. Because I want to see where this is going. The horrible pacing, that is. I want to see... <laughs> it's a little bit like watching um, the live-action Dragon Ball Z movie. <laughs> it's a train wreck, but you keep looking. That That is an excellent bad movie. You can tell it happened during the writer's strike. Oh, yeah. Because basically they were like, 
What scripts do we have lying around? Well, this is an incomplete one for Dragon Ball. We'll take it. I mean, when Robert's Anime Corner Store states in their newsletter, we are not going to carry this. It is not worth our time. <laughs> uh, no, Robert's Anime News Corner does not sponsor us. Though if you know someone. <laughs> <laughs> and this has been our thoughts on She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, Season 1, Episodes 5 through 7. And another outro, and hey, look at this. We made the episode shorter than what we watched. Yay, go us. So all the usual things, especially if, you know, you tend to watch YouTube. So like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell, watch other videos, check out the playlists, you know, all that good stuff. And just a reminder, be careful about spoilers and comments. Please try not to go ahead of where we're actually discussing. And we have lots of links. Lux's art, and so Patreon, and Tumblr, and DeviantArt, and Mastodon, and Twitter, and wherever else he remembers to link to and post. Financially, to get art, we have Lux's Commissions, Lux's Patreon, and Lux's Zazzle Store. And money changing hands without getting a drawing in return. Guess that's the thing. Coffee. You guys all know how this stuff works by now. Also, going back to YouTube just for a second, we have all the playlists, different categories. Okay, you've had it with She-Ra. Check out Ruby. Had it with Ruby? What's wrong with you? Go check out Ember's Reading Room. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogue, suggestions, and, of course, financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.